Good morning, everyone. Just doing a sound check for everyone on Zoom. Can you hear me? Yay, that's good. Can you all hear me? Is the, is the microphone, microphone's on? How's, how's that? Anything? That's good. Okay. Okay, good. Wonderful. Begin on page one. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. And together, almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may be continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we hear God's word to us in Scripture. A reading from the book of Amos. <clears throat> Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire. And it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you who turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate. And they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, you who take bribes and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Just as you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnants of Joseph. The word of the Lord. Amen. Psalm 90. We're going to read this responsibly. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long will you tarry? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be hot, glad all the days of our life. Make us glad by the measure of the days that you afflicted us and the years in which we suffered adversity. Show your servants your works and your splendor to their children. May the greatness of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper the work of our hands. Prosper our handiwork. A reading from Paul's letter to the Hebrews. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, 
joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we've had a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to, eternal, to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and father. He said to him, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, ground, word, life. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. One of the commentators I preach warns that this is one of those passages in scripture that, that quits preaching and goes right to meddling in our lives. Because there's, there's no way to sugarcoat the teaching of Jesus here. Um, he is talking about wealth. There's nothing metaphorical here that he's talking about. Jesus is talking about having too much wealth and how having too much of it prevents us from inheriting eternal life. This is not about getting to heaven. Jesus is not saying that, that rich people are going to hell. He is saying, though, that the rich are highly unlikely to enter the kingdom of God. This is about justification, about being in right relationship with God, not about heaven and hell. Still, ouch. You know? This is a lesson given in love, mind you, but even in love, it is destined, if not designed, to make us feel uncomfortable. I mean, this passage isn't preached directly very often because, well, who wants to hear that on a Sunday morning? I mean, 
Gone are the days when a good exhortation from the pulpit put a righteous spring in our steps. And this isn't even a pulpit exhortation. This is the lectionary. These are the words of Jesus Christ to you this morning. Now, another commentator I referenced made an offhand comment that, that no one in mainline Protestant denominations ever consider themselves rich. You know, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, now they are rich. We're comfortable, perhaps. <laughs> Fortunate, prosperous, but never rich. Rich is a vulgar term. That's unseemly. But let's clear that up, okay? So you all pay me about $81,000 a year. Uh, that's about 20% above the median household income in the U.S. Uh, Wendy just started working. It's part-time, and we're not sure exactly how that's going to work out for annually, uh, but it will be noticeable to us. Now, just as an aside, this is for Lynn's sake, um, we pledged $4,200 this year, about 5%. And over the next few years, we'll work up to a full tithe. Um, I had a colleague who always announced his, uh, his salary and his pledge um, because he had a few folks that always made sure to pledge more than the pastor. <laughs> because, well, just because. Uh, today is the last day of our pledge drive. So if, if you haven't pledged or if you wanted to at least consider adjusting it to surpass the pastor because, well, just because. In any case, by American standards, we, my family, we are not rich. We are decidedly in the middle. I mean, all that stimulus stuff this past year really helped us. But if you look beyond the borders, I mean, the global medium household income is under $10,000 a year. Uh, it was 9,700 by one quick Google search. All that was kind of old. Um, but this past year, it was 3,200 in India, uh, 6,200 in China. Now, obviously, a rupee goes a lot further in rural Bangalore than a dollar does in Brooklyn with an I or a Y. But by the sheer volume of wealth at our disposal, virtually every one of us in this room would be considered rich by most people in the world. And we all are compared to Jesus, even adjusted for inflation over the past 2,000 years. Is that enough talk about wealth to make most of us at least a bit uncomfortable? No. As Harry Potter would say, mischief managed, right? That this is exactly what Jesus was shooting for, making that young man squirm, but not for squirming's sake. Remember, right before he told them to sell everything he had and give it to the poor, the line is, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, I'm going to ruin your life. Right. <laughs> His teaching here is not as punishment for one who hoarded wealth at the expense of the poor, not at all. This is out of love for the one bearing the burden of wealth, the one entrapped by the allure of wealth, the drive to accumulate wealth, the need to protect and defend wealth, and of course, to use wealth. So all of this, he said, for that rich young man's own sake. Sure, the poor would benefit too, but they would benefit by the sacrifice that benefited the young man. That's a lot of benefits. Everyone benefits because for God, all things are possible. Now, Jesus' loving concern for that young man was that something, in this case wealth, was getting between him and God. His wealth served as a barrier to right relationship with God. That's the spiritual teaching here. It's not an indictment of the wealthy as enemies of humanity. Remember, Jesus' ministry was buoyed by those with wealth. I mean, Joseph of Arimathea, right? He was the one who could afford to buy the tomb for Jesus. Many of the early churches gathered in the homes of rich women. This parish exists in its current form. We have this beautiful building, these, they're placed in this lovely piece of land. You know, we have, you have a, a full-time priest because people with means have shared their means. Thank you. And of course, plenty of wealth is used sinfully used to exert sinfully disproportionate influence and sinfully disproportionate consumption of resources beyond the means of the planet. In our country, we make up what 5% of the world's population and we consume 25% of the energy. And of course, a lot of wealth is accumulated sinfully. That is the detriment of others and out of alignment with God's will. Today's lesson though, is about the damage that it does to the owners of wealth. I've got plenty of things that serve as a barrier between me and God, that, 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 that prevent me from having right relationship with God. I won't go into all the gory details, uh, 
But thanks be to God, money isn't really one of them. If it were, I probably wouldn't have ended up in the priesthood. It's tight sometimes for us, sure. We have a bit extra to others. But we always have enough what we need. And we don't really want much beyond that, fortunately, because wants, desire are, are powerful feelings. And when unrequited, deeply unpleasant, even dangerous ones that can lead us to very poor decision-making and, and, and reckless risk-taking. I grew up with enough privilege that, that money was never much of a concern as far as I knew, although my parents were surely reserved when I got a full-ride Navy ROTC scholarship to a very expensive school. That helped. But in any case, whether money was a concern or not, it was certainly never spoken of. But that concern is what Jesus is getting at here in this profound lesson. The great theologian Paul Tillich puts it most clearly and succinctly when he defined God as our ultimate concern. God is our ultimate concern. Whatever concerns you ultimately, whatever you consider to be most important, whatever you spend the most time on, that you dedicate the most energy to, that you put your best self into, that is what's going to become your God. Let that notion sink in. What are you putting your time, your energy, your life force into? Concerns that rise to the level of barriers between us and God are certainly not limited to wealth. Plenty of things get in the way of union with God. I mean, substances such as alcohol, cannabis, pills being used beyond the scope of their label. Things we do, sex gambling, food, you know, the, the, the pleasure of the table for pleasure's sake, you know, eating to, to squash the pain as well as body dysmorphia that leads to eating disorders, careerism, striving for success, status in society, achievement, competition, anything that makes us singular in our focus about anything but God has the potential to steer us wrong, to take our eyes off the prize that Jesus lays before our feet. Singularity of purpose is not a Christian virtue unless that singularity consuming you is God in Christ or the Holy Spirit and loving your neighbor as ourselves. That's a very countercultural message. So many, many things can distract us from what is truly important. But don't skip over the wealth part because it makes you uncomfortable or, 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 or feel judged. You know, I'm not saying these things. Take it up with him, Jesus. Like, really? I mean, how does that hymn go? Uh, are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care, precious Savior, still our refuge? Take it to the Lord in prayer. We do have a friend in Jesus. But what do we do with all of this? In these, in these moments, I think about the things I cling to, and I think, great, another, another self-improvement opportunity before me. You know, what did Mark Twain say? Uh, quitting smoking is the easiest thing in the world to do. I've done it at least a thousand times. <laughs> The author of the letter to the Hebrews has words of consolation for us. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we were, yet without sin. Jesus Christ has been through everything and knows everything and has compassion because of it. He knows everything about you, and he has suffered as you have suffered. He offers this teaching not in judgment or condemnation, but out of compassion, eternally offering both mercy and grace. The author of Hebrews continues, Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the end, when it comes to Jesus Christ in our lives, it is all about mercy and grace. We've been talking about these two divine gifts in our, our, our Julian of Norwich class. She wrote a lot about mercy and grace. And she wrote, these are two forms of action in one love. Mercy is the attribute of loving compassion that belongs to the tender motherhood of God. Grace is the attribute of nobility that belongs to God's royal nature and stems from that same love. Mercy works to protect, sustain, and bring life and healing. It springs from the tenderness of love. Grace works to build up and reward. 
endlessly trans transcending whatever we have earned through our loving and labor. It spreads far and wide, displaying the vast generosity and marvelous courtesy of our great God. This all flows from the abundance of love. Grace transforms our shame-filled failings into bountiful and never-ending solace. Grace lifts our terrifying falling into noble elevation. Grace converts our sorrowful dying into blessed, holy life. That's why we're still reading Julian, you know, 600 years later, right? If we take this stuff seriously, God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the scriptures, the revelations of divine love made to saints of the church across the ages, we realize, we will realize, we might realize that we have nothing to fear. Not even our greatest sins, our deepest failings in the eyes of God and humanity. I mean, you know, Julian's great quote, you know, all will be well, all be well, right, right. Well, in the full sentence, you know, this was something that Jesus said to her in one of her visions, one of her showings. And the full quote is, this is from, from Jesus. She heard this from Jesus. Um, Sin is inevitable, yet all will be well, and all will be well, and every kind of thing will be well. Sin is inevitable, yet you don't think God knows about you? What you do and fail to do? When you are naughty and when you are nice? <laughs> what you gossip about in the church parking lot, you know, or, or judge others about their own vaccine status or political affiliation or how they use their resources? Of course, of course God knows. Our, it's our human nature. And our human nature is accounted for in the big scheme of things. And God in Christ loves you, not in spite of those blemishes on our character, but because of them. As the author Barbara Kingsolver, you mentioned <laughs> Elizabeth, you Barbara Kingsolver downstairs. Uh, Barbara Kingsolver points out in her brilliant book, The Poisonwood Bible. Have you read that? You should. It's a great book. Uh, but she, she has this great quote from there that like, we are our injuries as much as our successes. God knows this. Jesus lived this. The Holy Spirit sustains everyone because we are all in that same pickle. So if wealth is your particular poison, you are far from alone. Or pride, or gluttony, or lust. We all have our own special concern that takes our lives off loving God with everything we have and our neighbors as ourselves. So what to do? Besides taking it to the Lord in prayer, Confess, confessing our sins, you know, duly attempting to repent and return to the Lord, Julian offers an observation about the duties of our soul. Jesus revealed to her, two duties belong to our souls. One is to reverently marvel. The other is to humbly endure, always taking pleasure in God. He wants us to remember that life is short, and it won't be long until we clearly see him, with him, all that we desire. Still, I couldn't help but wonder at the mercy and forgiveness I beheld in God. Reverently marvel, humbly endure. Mercy and forgiveness will follow. Now that is some religion you can take to the bank, so to speak. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Now let us contemplate our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page five in our service booklet. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, 
he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and God's kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. that we may continually seek you and find you, that we may know deep in our hearts that we are yours. We lift our hearts and voices to you. Hear us, good Lord. That your grace may always precede and follow, that our lives may be signs of your kingdom and witness to your goodness. We lift our hearts and voices to you. Hear us, good Lord. That there be peace in our hearts, in our churches, between neighbors and nations. May the peace we seek begin with you and overflow beyond measure. We lift Amen. our hearts and voices to you. Hear us, good Lord. We give thanks for your extravagant care of us, for your seeking after us, finding us, and keeping us close. We pray that we may follow your model of loving kindness to those with whom we live and work and worship, that your love for us may overflow into extravagant love for all your children. We lift our hearts and voices to you. Hear, Hear us, us, good Lord. Lord. We pray on behalf of those who are suffering with pain, who are paralyzed by fear, who are listless and restless and tired. Relieve their misery, be with them in their distress. Bring them to a new sense of hope and wholeness. We pray for Amelia, Andrea, Art, Arthur, Mary Boyd, Harry and Marie Bissell, Edward Dufresne, Giffy Full, Roger Grindle, Grace High, Bethany Hill, Jack Cooper, Jill, Justin, Jenny, Kayla, Kira and John Klinger, Keegan, Joanne Creston, Fred Marston, Sophia Partridge, Ronan, Diana Robson, Dennis Robertson, Carla Rosenzweig, Mary Semler, Kathy Smith, Peggy Smith, Marshall Smith, Terry Stephen Smith, Donnie Smith, Fred Stein, Marilyn Stewart, Carl and Carolyn Taylor, Judy Thomas, Holly Whalen, Cecile Wiley, Persis Williams, and Jordan and Sean. We lift our hearts and voices to you. Hear us, good Lord. We rejoice with those who have entered the larger life, who now reside among the saints in light. We pray for those who mourn and who experience a deep loss. We lift our hearts and voices to you. Hear us, good Lord. Pray for those who are celebrating birthdays this week, especially Andrew Connard, Jim Crawford, Kurt Schneider, Bitsy Bacon, and Nora Schroeder. We lift our hearts and voices to you. Hear us, good Lord. Pray for those who serve in the armed services, especially Abigail, Kyle Carino Mings, James Crow III, Andy Dittmer, Brian Haley, Sean Haley, Kyler Hall, Douglas Hamilton, Peter McGuire, Eric Partridge, Kevin West. We lift our hearts and voices to you. Hear us, good Lord. You are invited to add any additional intercessions at this time, either silently or aloud. Pray for Lizzie Sandlin, who was severely injured in a car accident. 
pairs for Gretchen and Alan. We lift our hearts and voices to you. Hear us, good Lord. Lord of the harvest, we pray that our global Christian community may fulfill your son's prayer and that we may soon be in the name of Christ as he is in you, his Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Please rise. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another safely in Christ's name. And now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice unto God. Yeah. 
All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thy own have we given thee. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O oh God, for the goodness and love which you made known to us in creation. In the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the savior and redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he gave it thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, O gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. They may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with Francis and Claire and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
in the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. This is God's table. All are welcome here. On the side of Christ, Lord of heaven. Talk to the body of Christ, Lord of heaven. Yeah, body of Christ, Lord of heaven. Lay in body of Christ, Lord of heaven. Who's with body of Christ, Lord of heaven. Our post communion prayer is found on page nine in our service booklet. If someone wants a million dollar idea, put a, uh, a glass wiping cloth on the outside of your mask, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We have a couple of very brief announcements today. Um, first off, um, as you notice in the sermon, um, the, the Julian of Norwich class has been excellent. It's been really good. Um, it, we're, we're pretty far into the book, but it's not kind of thing that like week to week it builds upon itself. So if you're if you want to join us, ten o'clock uh, on the regular Zoom channel that we use for everything, um, it's about an hour long conversation. It's been wonderful, um, and you don't even need to have the book if you don't have it. So and it's available in the um, it's a uh, public domain. So there's. There's, you can find copies of it all over the place if you wanted to look at it. Uh, we are uh, about to unveil the next Wednesday Seekers, which will start in, um, in three weeks. Uh, it's gonna be a book by Parker Palmer. Um, it was gonna be this one on paradox, uh, but for some crazy reason, it's out of print. So it won't be that one, but he has another book that he published a couple of years ago about the heart of democracy. Um, and so I'm gonna talk to the, uh, to the uh, adult ed group to, to get a clearance for that, but it'll probably be that by Parker Palmer. He is a, uh, a very well-known um, Quaker uh, uh, scholar and teacher and activist and all around uh, uh, what, what righteous troublemaker. Um, uh, he's really, really good. Uh, so we'll most likely be reading that, but, but, but I'll let you know. And it's easy to get, and the books are already, is, has, a, has a warning order to order them when the time comes. So. Um, that's all I have, but uh, Lynn, you want to talk about, we have our, this is our, our, our final day of our annual giving drive. So Lynn. First and foremost, let me thank all of you for your support and commitment, financial commitment to St. Francis Legacy Stewardship. We are indeed very, very grateful. If you might humor me today and let me go on a bit. I'll be leaving for Florida in a couple of weeks and you won't have to hear me preaching to the choir soon. <laughs> My partner, Mark, is culturally Jewish. He was born mitzvah at age 13 and decided that he no longer wanted to practice. And he hasn't. And he's now 75 years old. Almost daily or weekly, 
he'll be talking and all of a sudden some Yiddish Hebrew thing comes out of his mouth. And he says it with such conviction that I think he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> However, most times he has no recollection of what it means. Sometimes I think that the words are so fun that I use them all week. And then I finally Google them and realize what they are. And I enlighten him on the meaning. When we had our last, oh, wait, first, one of my very favorites of that is um, Yiddish. And it's a hawk minisha chinik, which means don't hit me with a teapot. <laughs> So at our last uh, vestry meeting, we decided on an end date for the stewardship. When I came home, I mentioned to Mark that we decided on a date, a closing date, of October the 10th. He has an opinion on all things, whether they are solicited or not. And he told me that he thought it was premature to do that because we hadn't gotten close enough to our goal. But in the next breath, he said, he thought it was a great idea to have an ending date. So this thing didn't drag on to Tish Baal. Tish Baal, there you go. <laughs> so I've used Tish Baal a few times in the last week or so. I used it in the same context I felt he did. I said, Mark, could you take the trash to the dump before Tish off? <laughs> <laughs> and he did. I then Googled Tish Bayov. Tish Bayov is a holy day, a Jewish holiday. It's not a high holiday like Rosh Hashanah, uh, which is the Happy New Year, Shana Tava. It's not Yom Kippur, which is the most solemn and serious of the Jewish holidays. It's the atonement for your sins. But Tish B'Av is like um, a warm-up for Yom Kippur. In the Jewish calendar, Tish B'Av comes in July or August, depending on the calendar. And Yom Kippur is in September or October, again, depending on the calendar. So it's kind of a warm up. It's a fasting and a, a penance. You're sorry for your, your sins. It got me thinking that here at St. Francis by the Sea, We are lucky to come to this table 52 weeks out of the year. The Jews buy tickets to the high holiday services. They buy their seats. It's done as a privilege. It's done with respect and it's done as a commitment to their faith. You can go past the synagogue where I live. There are several of them. You can go back on a Friday night and the parking lots are kind of empty. But in the high holidays, the place is a mob scene. Mm -hmm. The parking lots are full, so full that there's police to direct the traffic. You can go to a wealthy synagogue and pay thousands of dollars for your seats. Or you can go to a less popular synagogue and pay a couple hundred dollars. I have a friend that a couple years ago invited me to the Rosh Hashanah service. Her son was to join them, but he couldn't make it. So she had an extra ticket and invited me to go. In turn, I invited her to Midnight Mass 
to the church in Boca Raton, Florida, that has the very best music, because I thought that was important. We both enjoyed the experience. I go back to the 52 weeks a year that we are invited to this table. We are privileged to receive the blood of Christ, the body of Christ, and the blood of salvation. We can do that 52 weeks a year. I feel blessed and I'm grateful. And we too can show our respect and our commitment to our faith by our stewardship to St. Francis by the Sea. We had hoped that today would be our last day of the campaign. We have fallen a bit short of our goal, but we have hit the $200,000 mark. We are to date, we have received 65 pledges and they total $201,750. I think I'm right, Kevin. I am. That is 25 pledges short and $33,000 short of our goal last year and our current goal. We can't stop here. We need, <clears throat> we need those dollars to support this church. So I'm asking <clears throat> if we can extend our stewardship campaign in the hopes of receiving the necessary pledges to support our budget. We are not an extravagant church. We run a pretty tight ship here. And there's not much that we could consider cutting from that budget. So I'm asking and hoping that our mailbox tomorrow will be full of pledges. And if you haven't already pledged, please reconsider and do so. And if you have, again, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your support of St. Francis by the Sea. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Um, thank you for all you've done with this whole campaign. It's, it's, thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? Melissa. I just wanted to um, remind people that the fall cleanup will happen on the 30th of October. We will start at 10 o'clock and around noon. And um, we decided to do a potluck planting outside. So we'll set up some tables and we'll work hard enough to warm our bodies and then, <laughs> and then have a meal together. So just bring a rake and something to share. Okay. Excellent. Okay.
forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia. 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 Alleluia.